بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد بن الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد all praises due to Allah we praise him and we glorify him and we send his peace and blessings on the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم on his family and his companions and all those who call to his way until the day of judgment inshallah just before uh, we call Imam Hamza to speak there's just a few opening introductory remarks inshallah the first is once again uh, jazakallah khair for your presence this evening and on behalf of the Muslim Students Association at the University of Toronto, St. George Campus, and on behalf of IPCI Canada, we'd like to welcome you here, inshallah. And we begin the program by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this night a meaningful evening, a, mean, a night where we can learn from the words of Imam Hamza, inshallah, and we can gain something that will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life and in the hereafter, inshallah. Uh, the program, as you know, tonight's topic is entitled Lambs to the Slaughter, Our Children in Modern Education. This is first of a two-night lecture program we're hosting. Inshallah, Imam Hamza will be also be speaking tomorrow night in this very hall concerning the topic of action in the last days. As many of you already know Imam Hamza, I'll make the introduction very brief. Imam Hamza hails from Santa Clara, California, recently where he is the Imam. He's originally from He's also originally from California. Imam Hamza has studied all over the Middle East, in particular in Mauritania and other parts of North Africa. We've heard him many, many times before, and we've come to respect his insight and his wisdom, inshallah. Uh, many of us, especially some of the young people here in Toronto, have had the opportunity to study with him and to be with him for short periods of time. And inshallah, I hope tonight that we'll be able to gain on this very, very important issue. And the issue, as Imam Hamza uh, described to us earlier, is the issue of our children in modern education, in particular the, the Muslim crisis, the very severe crisis that is facing our children and our youth, and in fact our entire communities. So without further ado, inshallah, I'll ask Imam Hamza to come to the podium and address us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala afdali khalqillah, ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad ibn Abdullah, wa ala alihi wa tayyibina tahirin, wa sahabatihi wa man tibi'ahum bi ahsanin ila yawm al-deen. Alhamdulillah, الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة اللهم إني عذبك أن أضن وضن وزن وزن وضرم وضرم وجهر ويجهر علي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I want to first just say that I was very fortunate because I gave very short notice about the overhead uh, projectors um, and somebody just happened to be here that said he wasn't supposed to be here but we don't believe that people are ever where they're not supposed to be, they're always where they're supposed to be. So that's why we believe uh, that nobody can ever be in an accident, it doesn't happen. People, somebody said he was in the wrong place at the right time. No, he was in the right place at the right time, but was he in the right state? <laughs> you see, everybody's in the right place at the right time, but the problem is, is are they in the right state to meet their Lord? So, and really that's, I think, a good introduction into what I want to talk about. Are we in the right state? And uh, people talk a lot about the Islamic state, but uh, I think even though that's an alien term to the Islamic vocabulary because uh, it's a Latin word which means something that stays the same and Islam is always expanding by its nature, it's never static and, uh, and so the, the idea of uh, Islamic state if you want to term the word in Arabic hal which also means state then yeah we need an Islamic state, an Islamic hal or an Islamic condition, an Islamic state of mind and the Islamic state of mind is what is necessary to proceed an Islamic situation of governance where the hukum is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to no one else. But the foundation of that has been, uh, is and always will be uh, a cater of Muslims who are committed to the truth who reach a critical mass. And when they reach a critical mass, then at that point, uh, something amazing happens. And we can see that in the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, in his uh, life and history. Uh, I just want to point out, this is uh, what's known as the light spectrum, the visible light spectrum. And, and I'd just like us all to reflect for a moment about the, physical, the, uh, the visible light spectrum, because I think it's an excellent metaphor 
uh, for the, uh, the Islamic worldview and the non-Islamic or the kafir worldview because both of them are worldviews and they're in contradistinction to each other and there is antagonism between the two. To say that we're not uh, antagonistic to kufr is to tell a lie because Muslims are antagonistic to kufr. Uh, not perhaps in the ways that the kuffar would like to uh, pretend in their media and in their, uh, and in their uh, misrepresentation of Islam, but in reality, Islam is, in its deep innermost essence, in deep antagonism to batil, because Islam is deen al-haq, and it sees everything other than that as batil. And so if you look here, that little black spectrum, is what they call the visible light spectrum. That is what everything that we're seeing now is in that spectrum. But if you notice, you keep going down and you go up and you go into infrared uh, light and you go into x-rays and gamma rays, there's a whole other spectrum there that we're not seeing or witnessing. But it exists nonetheless. Now for centuries human beings thought that this was all there was in terms of these rays. This is not the ghaib we're talking about. This is mulk. You see, we're not talking about ghaib here. This is mulk. But for centuries, human beings thought that the mulk was in that little black spectrum. That is a very small spectrum of reality. If we're just talking about mulk, we're not talking about malakut and other realms. We're just talking about mulk at this point. So for centuries, human beings in their ignorance thought that's all there was. In the mulk. Now they believed in the ghaib or the unseen. Well, in recent times they've extended it. You see, now this is out of their ignorance. They always think that whatever they know is, is everything there is. Right? So it, that line doesn't necessarily stop down there or up there. That's just where they've arrived at now with their outward sciences. And the reason that I began with Surah to Rome is because it's the European chapter. It's called Surah to Rome. And in Arabic, Rome means the Europeans. That's what it means. And sometimes translated as the Greeks, but we know Greeks are not Romans. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire meant the European Empire. And up until very recently, the Muslims, and they still do in North Africa, called the Europeans Romi. Anybody that was from Europe was known as a Romi, and sometimes they called them Ifrenj, from the Franks. Now, Surah to Rome says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَةِ الدُّنْيَا they know the outward of this world, but as far as the inward goes, the reality about the akhirah, about what's beyond, they have no knowledge. They're in a state of complete heedlessness. And this is to me indicative of that condition. If we look at this just as being, now I want you just to imagine that that little black spectrum there is the, that's the mulk. Now the ghaib or the unseen that no one knows except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophets were given a portion of that knowledge to inform us about. So the prophets had access to the, the, uh, the angelic realm. They saw angels and they saw things that we did not see. The prophet sallallahu on the Isra and the Mi'raj saw wondrous things and came back and informed his companions about those things. And they believed in those things because they knew that he was sadiq al-masduq, the truthful and the one who is believed. And he is Al-Amin, the trustworthy one. So these people are trapped in that little mulk, and yet the Muslims have an understanding, or traditionally at least they did, that there was a whole spectrum of reality that we have no access to, which is called Al-Ghayb. And Allah begins his book by saying, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ That they're the people who believe in the unseen. So we believe in things that these people do not believe in. And that's a starting point, and that's a deep antagonistic perspective given the fact that gross secular materialism is the dominant religion of the age. The idols of the age are idols of the mind. They're no longer wooden and stone idols. They're idols of the intellect. They're idols that are called al-awthan uh, al-wahmiya. They're just illusions in the conceptualization of human beings. And Islam is an iconoclastic deen by its nature. It breaks idols. So it doesn't just break the outward idols, it breaks the inward idols. And the, the foundation for that is even in the Arabic language because there's a difference between sunam and wathan. And Raghab al-Spahani says one of the, a sunam is formed outwardly, the wathan is the conceptualization that takes place in the mind of the idolater. So we are in a deeply idolatrous society. We're in a society of idol worshippers.
And unfortunately, many Muslims have fallen into the same conceptual idols that these other people believe in. And this is part of the tragedy because we have all of these antibodies, if we follow our deen, we have antibodies that protect us from these kufr antigens, right? If you know physiology, an antigen comes into the body and the body has a natural immunity and it begins to formulate these antibodies and they will protect the body from that foreign invader. Well, we've been invaded, folks. And the amazing thing about it is, instead of fighting off the infection, we encourage it. We encourage the infection because not only do we not allow our antibodies to develop, but we allow the antigens to proliferate until they've literally taken over the whole body. And the way that we do that is through the educational system because we have adopted almost wholeheartedly a kafir educational system that is deeply and grossly alien to the Islamic perspective. Could you switch the slide there? Now I also... Uh, slide, I would just like to say this is not a bid'ah. <laughs> because the Prophet Sallallahu used visuals. Uh, he once was with his Sahaba and he drew a square on the, on the sand and then he drew a line and he drew lines coming out of the sand and he drew a line outside the square and explained that that was the ajal and there were these lines and things like this. And, and so the Prophet Sallallahu used uh, that, that technique. So I'm not doing anything new, we're just maybe expanding on the, uh, the sand, but again, you know, this is the age of, of sand, the silicone chip and all of these things, it's just sand. Everything comes from the desert. <laughs> now, I want to look at this uh, hadith which Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu relates, and it's a hadith that's uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, and it's a deeply important hadith. Uh, all of the hadith are important, but they have uh, obviously ranks and degrees uh, in, in what the Prophet ﷺ wanted to con convey to the Muslims because there are hadiths that you can uh, live your whole life uh, and never have it heard but they will not affect your worldview or your understanding because other hadiths fulfill that function. This is one of the hadiths that's actually essential for the Muslim to understand the meaning of it. And the hadith says, Kullu mawludin wurida al fitra. Now sometimes this is mistranslated saying every child is born a Muslim. You will see it translated. It does not say that in the Arabic language. That is a tafsir or an interpretation coming from the idea that this is deen al fitra. That Islam is deen al fitra. It's the deen of fitra. But in fact the hadith says kullu mawludin wurida al fitra wa abawahu yuhawidanihi aw yunasiranihi and it is his parents who will make it a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian, a fire worshiper. Now, this hadith, first of all, gives us a, a very profound insight into uh, societies and the nature of what is termed now in modern sociology, socialization. This is what they call in, in sociology, socialization, that people are socialized by their environments into a way of behaving, a behavioral pattern, a model of behavior that is taken solely from outside of themselves. Now this behavioral pattern can either be congruous with the inherent nature of the human being or it can be incongruous with it. In other words, it can be disharmonic and create turbulence in the self. If it is in harmony with it, then it's in harmony with the fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inherently made people follow this natural normative pattern of being or behavior. Now I just, if you look at these four models, a healthy situation is when the child who is naturally inclined towards fitrah will be facilitated in their developmental nature in fulfilling their nature that Allah has made them upon by the family and the society. And this is an ideal situation in which the child is not only raised by Muslim family, Muslim parents, Muslim sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, with an Islamic worldview and an Islamic behavior, but the society at large is facilitating the tarbiyah or the nurturing of this child. So the child is not only becoming a Muslim inside the house, but outside the house the Islam is being confirmed. And this is Medina and Munawwara. 
This is the, the city of the Prophet ﷺ, which is a blueprint, a model for the, the society in which the human being was intended to live and exist in. And that is why it is our Medina al fadira It is the virtuous city. It is the city which we are supposed to look and take as our example. Now, unfortunately, there are many modern Muslims who have this idea that somehow these people, that the Prophet ﷺ was living in a primitive uh, culture that uh, was really just outside of the Iron Age, very simplistic life, and somehow that it's relative to the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century, but what does that have to do with us living in the 20th century? And this is part of the disease of the Muslims. That Medina and Munawwara was the best society that has ever existed as a model for human beings. Now, the amazing thing to me is that amongst the Kuffar, there are many people now talking about what they call communitarianism which is trying to downscale cities, trying to live in, in small-scale communities where people can actually get to know people and that there's a sense of, of belonging and community where the virtuous qualities of human beings are literally inculcated in the inhabitants of that area. And this is really at a theoretical mode, although there have been attempts uh, within the Western uh, cultures of people disengaging. Unfortunately, we know that you have to have a straight blueprint in the first place for this to work. If you don't have a straight blueprint, it won't work. And that's why they are always doomed to failure ultimately. Now, you will find within the Western societies, there is a group of people, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, or Hutterites, you have the Amish people, that really the, uh, what they have going for them is simply that they have opted to maintain tradition and to oppose the radical impact and effect of innovation in societies. And the whole idea of bid'ah is a really important idea in Islam, the idea of an innovation and the danger of innovation in cultures, which should not be misconstrued as being an innovation uh, for things that enhance society. But the Muslims have always been wary of any new introduction into the society. And you will see this by the fact that the first concern of the Muslims in Medina was the introduction of the lavatory into the house. This was one of the first concerns of the Muslims in Medina of bringing actual bathrooms into the houses. They were concerned about that as an innovation. Now the point being, whether it's good or bad, there's obviously benefits to it and there's obviously things that are not beneficial. And what the Muslim does is they outweigh the maslaha and the mafsada the benefit and the harm. This is what we do. This is the basis of our deen. The deen is based on jalb al-maslaha wa dar al-mafsada. The whole of sharia can be reduced to those two principles and if you understand them, then you understand the point of Islam. The point of Islam is to bring benefit to human beings and to avoid harm. It's called awamar wa nawahi. Ittiba'ad awamar wa ittinab nawahi That is the whole foundation of Islam. Now, I was uh, a few weeks back uh, talking, somebody asked me a question, and I said, well, you need to ask the, you know, scholars about that, the people of fatwa, and, he, and somebody in the audience said, what about tahkim al-aqal? You know, what about just using our intellects? And I said, tahkim al-aqal lil You, the, 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 you know, the authority of the intellect is for the people of intellect. And obviously, not everybody is an aqal. Because the Quran asked the question, afara ta'qilun? Don't you use your brains? And I'm almost of the opinion that the brain has become a vestigial organ. Like in evolution, they, they say that an organ that's not used disappears. Which really is a proof against evolution because the brain hasn't been used for a very long time and it's still around. So if you go to the next stage here, this is a confused child and the degree of confusion depends on the degree of kufr in the society because kufr is by degrees. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that the human being يَتَفَاوَتُونَ فِي الْكُفْرِ بِتَفَاوَتِهِمْ فِي بُغْضِ People will vary in their degrees of kufr by their hate of my message. You see, so people that uh, hate the message of the Prophet ﷺ, those are much worse in their kufr than people that might be neutral. Because people tend to, with open minds, will tend to be open to things. And if your mind's not open and capable of changing its opinions, you have to question whether you have one or not. 
right? Because the whole function of a mind is to take in information, to process it, and then to use it for your benefit. And, uh, and that's the point of the intellect. So if your brain is not fulfilling that function, then the question is whether you have one or not. Now, if you look at the family here, this is a situation where you find some of the families probably in this country uh, will follow this pattern. Where the child has fitrah, that's given from Allah. Fitratullah allati fatra nasa alayha. This is the fitrah that Allah has given human beings. And they have it, whether we, we don't give it to them, that we take it away from them. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in the same hadith, تُنْتَجَ الْبَهِيمَةُ بَهِيمَةً جَمْعًا هَلْ تَحِسُّونَ مِنْ جَدْعًا The animal is created in, in full form, in its natural form. Do you see any mutilation? Do you see mutilation in the animal? No, that's something human beings do to the animals. Clipping the ears like the Quran says that shaitan inspired them to do these jahiliya practices. Now those people were just clipping ears. <laughs> I mean... What would, what would the Sahaba think about taking the genetic information from a, a sheep and putting it in a goat and making what they call a, a I think they call it a geep, which exists now, you see, and sharrul baliya ma I mean, that's a horrific thing. These people are manipulating the nature of Allah. And this is what Allah says, la tabdila li khalqillah. Now this la, in the Arabic language, you have different types of la. You can have la nafi, which is where you say it's impossible, like la ilaha. And ilaha there is what's called mansub, or it's in the accusative case. Why? Because it's negating the possibility of a God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in this ayah, the mufassirun, by and large, and it's obvious now, given the time, Ibn Umar said one of the best ways of interpreting the Qur'an is to let time lapse, so that you see the Qur'an manifest. La tabdila li khalqi Allah is called la nahi, which is a prohibitive la. It's prohibiting us to change the creation of Allah, which indicates that we can change the creation of Allah, that it's within our power to change the creation of Allah. And this is one of the things that shaitan promised, that he would order them to change the creation of Allah, that they would change. And this is shaitan's oath, that he would make them change the creation of Allah, and we can see it all around us. The mutilation of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the worst of all of these mutilations is the mutilation of the fitrah of a child. The inherent nature of the child which is being mutilated by the society. Now, if you are living in a place like Syria, the society, and I'm not picking on Syria, I could choose any, I could say Pakistan or I could say Malaysia or I could say Mauritania or I could say Senegal, I can give you any name from any of the Muslim cultures now that exist and they will all fall into that pattern which is the arrow going against the fitrah of the child. But they are by degrees. For instance, if you grow up in the deserts of the Sahara where I spent some time, the fitrah is by and large enhanced by the society itself because people are still in a fitrah nature. But that nature is deeply susceptible to the virus of kufr. Why? Because they're extremely simple people and they don't understand the age they're living. One of the Mauritanians told me that we're like the people of the cave. We went to sleep for 300 years and we woke up and the whole world's changed. You see, now that's a crisis because I think that's applicable to the entire Muslim world. People just went to sleep at a certain point. And the unfortunate thing about it is, is that in this culture there's an excuse for going to sleep because they don't have a divine alarm clock. We have a divine alarm clock five times a day. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. That's a reminder to people five times a day. And then in the morning, as salatu khayrun min al -nawm. It's better than sleep. Don't go to sleep. But wa min ayatihi manamakum billayri wa nahar. From his signs, your deep sleep in the day, in the night, and in the day. The Prophet ﷺ, or it's related from Sayyidina Ali, people are asleep. When they die, they wake up. Surah Al-Rum again. is what's called ma'tuf Ali. So it's like the same sleep. It's a continuous sleep. The only difference is, now we're walking around. Looking like we're awake. Tahsibu <laughs> You think they're awake, but they're really asleep. 
So this society is going against, now this creates a confusion in the child. And the confusion will be by degrees. In a culture like this, where we have literally inundated with kufr. And the sad thing about it is, now, really I would have to, uh, to warrant, I mean there, that family, Allahu Anam, I think it'd be kind of confused and have two arrows. One going towards fitrah, one going against it. Because the, the Muslims that want their children to be good Muslims, despite that fact, the vast majority of them have televisions in their house. And they're allowing the, this virus of kufr to come directly into their house and, and raise their children. Unbelievable. I mean, this is, if this isn't a sign of deep and grotesque sleep, I don't know what is. That you would allow your child to sit in front of that television and watch the kufr that comes on that television. And people say, well, what about Sesame Street? Sesame Street, that, subhanallah. I mean, first of all, you get a child used to watching Sesame Street and then try to get them to sit in front of a, a teacher and be able to listen to a talk. Really. It's, it's, what it is is an engendering in children this desire for constant stimulation. A, B, C, boom. And then new, new words and new phrases and big bear or big bird or whatever, all these crazy things made up in the imaginations of really sick people. I mean, the man that invented half those things died of AIDS. So you can kind of get an idea of what was going on in his syphilitic mind. <laughs> so this here, you have this society, and they say, in Sesame Street, it's so nice, you know. I mean, really, you, people, some people, Americans would be shocked, you know, or Canadians be shocked. Sesame, is he saying something's wrong with Sesame Street? You know, what's wrong with Sesame Street? That's what's wrong with it. If Tahya Simsim, you know, like, Open sesame. That's what they want to do. Open the child of your mind and dump all of that garbage in there. And that's what they do. And you say, well, he learned the alphabet. You can teach your child the alphabet in 10 minutes. You don't need to have him sit in front of Sesame Street day in and day out to learn the alphabet. So this is the confused child. And again, the confusion will be by degrees. The next you see this confused state. This is when the child is for fitrah and the family is against it and the society is for it. This is the munafiq. You see like Abdullah ibn Ubayy who was the leader of the munafiqeen, his son was a righteous man and he wanted to kill his father. His son was a righteous man so his son was fitrah but the family was munafiq going against his inherent nature and his inherent nature won out. Why? Because the society was for the fitrah. So the society overcome the negative tendencies of the hypocritical family. Because fitrah is a powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing and we shouldn't underestimate it even in these non-Muslims because there's still glimmers of fitrah in these people if they haven't uh, gone to the PhD level. I mean usually if you get them before that you might still have a, a little spark of fitrah there. But by the time they get into higher education that's it. That's where they pour the cement on it there. Now the final one, this is, this is a danger to society and that, that's what we're in now, you see. We're, we're, children are being raised completely out of, there's no fitrah. In other words, in traditional Christian, Jewish, uh, even in the Eastern uh, philosophies like Confucianists, if you study Confucianism, it's very, very similar to the Islamic understanding. The ideas of virtue, of respecting the parents, of respecting tradition, respecting elders. There's not a lot of differences. So in the society, although it was iwaj, there's some crookedness in it, there was still some uprightness that would maintain uh, the sum of the nature of the fitrah. We're in a culture now that is completely bereft of any fitrah whatsoever. And this is not an exaggeration. I am not exaggerating. We are in a society now that is sanctioning the marriage between men and men and women and women. And this is happening in my state right now. And people are going out, uh, marching for this. They're being taught in schools in sessions they call values clarification. Where you clarify that values are relative. Everything's relative. And I had to take courses in that in order to get a degree. 
in order for me to clarify in my mind that really if I thought there was anything called truth with a capital T as an objective reality outside of myself, I was crazy. I was a fanatic, an extremist, a danger to the society. This is what we're dealing with. This is the type of culture we're dealing with. And our children that are put into those schools don't think there's not an agenda there. There is an agenda. And if your children are in those schools, they are imbibing that agenda because their nature is to absorb. And the amana, the trust that Allah has placed upon human beings is on the parents to preserve the fitrah of the child. And if you're not preserving it, you're destroying it. Because it doesn't stay the same. It's either in increase or decrease. The Prophet ﷺ said, you, the, the parents will make him. And I'm, these are archetypes. Don't think this means, well, I'm Muslim. My child's going to be Muslim, of course. No. Don't think. We're talking about archetypes. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said in his Iqtida Sirat al-Mustaqim fi Mukhalifati Ashab al-Jahim that the Muslims will go astray two ways. The way the Jews go astray and the way the Christians go astray. In other words, we will go astray either by making our children Jews or by making them Christian in their outlook, in their perspective. It doesn't mean that they, if you ask them, are you a Jew? No, I'm a Muslim. But is his outlook Muslim? Is his reality Muslim? This is the question that has to be asked. And unfortunately, the answer that resoundingly comes back is, by and large, no. They're not. They're mutilated. Jada. They've been mutilated. This is what's happened. And it's a crime against the parent because the hadith that is mutafaq alayh, kullukum ra'in wa kullu ra'in mas'ulun an ra'yatihi. Every one of you is a shepherd. And the shepherd is responsible for his flock. And the first flock of the man is the children and the, and the, and the women of the household. Save yourselves and your families. So the family is the responsibility of the man. I mean, the other day I was uh, gi giving a talk and just talking about uh, the, the necessity for mutual reciprocity between men and women working together to create an Islamic environment for their children and I was saying that unfortunately a lot of men do not nurture uh, their, the women in, in our culture uh, amongst the Muslims. This is a fact. And this man said, See, everybody memorizes the ayahs they like. That's what I noticed. V very few Muslims memorize a lot of the Quran, but they memorize the ayahs they like. And you can usually tell a Muslim by the type of ayahs he quotes. So I said, well, you know, why don't you finish it? Because Allah has preferred some over others. Well, what's the tafsir say? Because men do jihad. Because they do amr bin ma'roof and nahi an al-munkar. Because they do infaq fi sabilillah. Where are those men? I'd like to meet them. Where are they? Seriously, it's not, I don't think it's a laughing matter. Where are those men? الَّذِينَ يُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ سِرًّا وَعَلَنِيَّةً الَّذِينَ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Where are those men? Those are قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ Because Abu Hayyana Tawheedi said, he didn't say, الدُّكُور قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى الْإِنَاثِ That uh, males are caretakers of females. He said, الرِّجَالِ قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ That men are over women as caretakers. Rijal. And Abu Hayyan al Tawheed in Al Bahar al Muhid says, Laysa kullu man yamliku lahya rajul. Not everyone that possesses a beard is a man. Even the goat has a beard. <laughs> so this is what we're dealing with here a danger to society. And then they're wondering, see, look at, and this is the irrationality of, of human beings, because we have this uh, infinite. Uh, a seemingly infinite uh, capacity for irrational behavior and beliefs. When, when the so-called, all these, the terrorist bombings happening, all, Americans stopped traveling overseas, right? All the airlines got worried because it all went down. And you, the average American has 
1,000 times greater chance of being killed in, in his own city than he'd ever have, but doesn't stop him from going outside, right? This is the type of irrationality you have. But what we're dealing with, and what these people do not want to admit, is that they have created children who are an absolute danger to their societies. These children are bereft of fitra. It's been literally ripped from them. They allow them to watch pornography constantly on the televisions. They allow them to see brutalization of human beings. I went into a, uh, one of these uh, malls in California, and there was an there arcade there, and I was with my wife, and I just wanted to look. I, it was, to me, those places are like hell. It, it's something you imagine one of the circles of hell being like one of those places where, where people have to play pinball for eternity. And I looked in there, and all, it's all dark energy. But there was one young boy with a huge computer screen. He was about 11 years old. And he had a gun. And on the screen were computerized images of human beings that were almost lifelike. And I watched him for about two minutes, and he killed about 40 of these computerized images, shooting them where they go, uh, and then they fall down and drop dead and he scores up another and that's how you win the game by killing the most people that you can kill and then they say well we have no scientific evidence that there's any correlation between violence in society and uh, media and what I mean this is what they have experts come and do this I mean what, what do you think that that means if somebody's uh, absorbing this because our brain is literally it's it's a sponge and it absorbs images and those images you cannot get out of your brain you will not get them out of your brain I mean those of you who have watched a good deal of television or film you have those images permanently etched in your minds and those images will be a barrier to purifying yourself to what's called tahannuth which is to literally uh, to purify the internal tahannuth is what the Prophet ﷺ did uh, before uh, he got the revelation. And if you look in the, uh, the books, they usually say, which is not the meaning of tahannuth. I mean, that's one of the meanings. But the meaning of tahannuth is to fight hint. Is to fight hint. And hint is internal shirk. It's all of these false idols that we carry around in us. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is that he was bitakalluf. Tafa'ul is for takalluf, that he was literally struggling against these uh, inherent aspects of the human being and if you want to do tahannud and you're filled with all these images and all of these things the Prophet ﷺ, when, when he got near music Allah caused him to fall asleep he, didn't even, he wasn't even exposed to these sensory images his, his blessed eyes never even looked upon the haram really I mean, he was not exposed to these type of sensory images, but he was in a jahili culture, and he was exposed to their idols and to all of these things, and purifying the one from these outward idols is part of the task of the Muslim. Could, could you switch now? Now, this is a little hard to see, but this, is, this now is, is, uh, is some scientific confirmation for what is known as the fitra. And what's happening, could you focus it a little? Is it possible to? There, that's fine. What's happening here is at birth. What happens at birth, there's massive development. I mean, we go from unicellular creatures, the zygote, the splitting of the cells, within three months, just the, the growth that has taken place within the, the, the embryo is phenomenal. It's, it's, it's really unbelievable and, and it's worth looking into and studying because the Quran does deal with embryology. When we are born, our brains will increase uh, size several times. The highest of all of the animals, the, the primates, are literally born with basically what they have in terms of their brains are, are intact. There's very little development in the first year. For the human being, there's 12 years of deep neurological development. 12 years, right before puberty. At the age of about 12 or 13, which is when a child begins to enter into tekelluf, a, a hormone is literally released which will destroy all of the neurological connections that have not been developed in those 12 years. So you're basically, at a certain age, that's all you have for the rest of your life to work with. Now it's massive. 
And most people will never use all of them. In fact, most people, I mean the latest estimates, is that we're using less than 0.1% of the neocortex. Less than 0.1%. That is the latest estimate. Now, I think that's high, personally. But th that's what they say, and so I'll go by that. You know, I mean, it's a vanni thing. Allahu alam, how much is being used. But the, traditionally, I believe the only way that you could have an individual like Imam Siyuti or Imam al nawawi or Abu Hamad al-Ghazali or Aisha, uh, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, that you could have these type of intellects was that they, were, they had fatah from Allah, an opening from Allah, and there was a massive uh, uh, a brain capacity was being utilized, which comes from a deep state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can see that uh, the child between uh, the birth and the age of one and really up to the age of two, there's massive development going on. And this is what's called the R system of the brain because we have a triune brain. It has three uh, aspects. And the R system is the reactionary brain. They call it the reptilian because of the evolution, the whole theory of evolution. But the idea here is that the child, if you notice when they're first born, they're grasping, they're getting into their, their bodies. The neurological system is not fully intact, so they can't touch things with, with any dexterity. And this dexterity is acquired over a time, and there are ways to stimulate that, which happen and occur naturally if they're allowed to. And then you move at the age of one with the beginning of the limbic system and that will go on. If you look, the R system will go to the age of seven, which is an important thing because by the age of seven, then their, their basic neurological system is intact to enter into serious uh, study and the acquisition of knowledge. And this is why in the traditional Muslim cultures, serious study began at the age of seven, at Dibuhum. Li Sab'in is after La'ibuhum Li Sab'in from the tradition from Sayyidina Ali to play and nurture them for seven years and then and playing has to do with dexterity of teaching the body how to uh, enter into its inherent uh, nature and then at the age of uh, one to the age of about uh, right there you can see eleven the limbic system which is the emotions are going to be developed and children go through these stages. And the first stage, interestingly enough, is called trust versus mistrust. Generally in the Western uh, psychological, what they call developmental psychology. And it's a useful, I think, science because it, cer it follows certain patterns because they come out of observation. And trust versus mistrust is about whether or not the child can trust the caregivers, the mother and the father. And this has a deep and profound impact on the child, whether they're able to trust human beings later on in their life. And then you move, you can see at the age of four, the beginning of the right hemisphere. Now the right hemisphere is that which deals with the play, the, the imaginative, the creative side of the human being because we have a split brain to the right and left hemispheres. Now at the age of seven is right when the left hemisphere activity comes in and this is when children can learn because left brain deals with learning language acquisition, mathematics, these type of things. This follows the Islamic model, which is that you should begin serious study at the age of seven. And to begin serious study prior to that, traditionally the Muslims did not begin other than rote memorization, which began at about four to five years old, at very gently and very easy initially. And then at about the age of six and a half, about the age of six and a half to seven, then the, the teacher, the mu'addib, would become more uh, firm in his teaching, imparting the Qur'an by rote. Now, one of the things about educating children is that children have a, a massive capacity to absorb information, but they have very little understanding. This is obviously, for anyone that has an ounce of reflection, is because for the first seven years of education there should be massive rote memorization taking place and the first and most important and primary thing is to teach them the Quran and this is what every single Muslim civilization has done and you will find no greatness in the Muslim world that wasn't founded on an educational system that was based on the memorization of the Quran none whatsoever and you can show me in the books and you can't it's not there Every single Muslim culture that develops science, technology, governance, ethics, philosophy, anything of the Islamic achievements that happened traditionally were based on educational systems that spent at least three or four years in rote memorization of the Qur'an. And this is not a trivial pursuit. Absolutely not. Because the brain, this is, this, the effect that the Qur'an has on the brain is massive. And if it's coupled with 
understanding and knowledge, which obviously there was a separation that took place in the Muslim Ummah. I mean, we, the, something went deeply wrong in our educational institute because uh, of the condition of the Muslims now, obviously. But the separation of the Muslims from the Book of Allah was a primary intention of the colonial powers. And we have documented evidence of this again and again, of seeing the necessity of ripping the people from the Quran. And you can see it in Ataturk taking away the uh, Arabic script and putting the Latin script. You can see this done in Malaysia, where people traditionally learned also in West Africa, amongst the non-Arabic speaking countries, where they had Arabic scripts, they learned to read the Quran, they wrote their language in the Arabic language, and despite that, these kuffar, uh, convince these, uh, these hypocrites and basically puppets to adopt the Latin script, which has nothing to do with our culture or civilization, in order to elevate these people, right? In order to take them out of their uh, dark ages into the uh, enlightenment of uh, 20th century Western civilization, civilization, right? So uh, now you go here at the, from seven until about, now at about 15, you see the right brain begins to finish it, and then the left hemisphere will go on to about the age of 18, and then you move into uh, the uh, deep ability to understand will start taking place at the age of about 15. Now, interestingly enough, 15 is traditionally the age of taklif, if puberty does not manifest. In the Shafi'i Madhab, 15 was the age at which uh, taklif uh, became incumbent upon somebody who did not show outward signs of and that's because of full maturity of the brain. So they had an understanding of this by Firasa that this would take place. Now, could you move to the next uh, slide? Now I just want to look at how dark uh, this system here. This is uh, something that I did called, I call, I'm calling it the Kafir model, where fact is only authority. But fact is always as interpreted by the teacher. It's never an objective thing, you see, because if you go to one school, uh, they might believe one. Like if you go and study evolution in France, it's very different from studying evolution in America. They have completely different views on quote-unquote fact. But yet at the, uh, at the lower levels of schooling, they will teach children all of this science as if it's fact. They'll teach you the, the table of elements as if this is fact. What you learn as you move into graduate school, where they teach you the secrets, just like in Freemasonry, when you move up the ranks and you get your degrees. You see, you move up by degrees. You get your uh, secondary degree and then you get your uh, BA degree. I mean, it's interesting. They, they use the same uh, Masonic terminology. And then at the age of about, when you move into the PhD, what they'll let, the, the secret they let you in on is that really there, is, there are no facts. You see? And, and this person who's been indoctrinated for the last 16 years is, whew, there's no facts? You mean I can criticize everything? And, and that's what they expect you to do for your PhD. You have to criticize something. You have to break it down. You have to tear it down. You have to rip it apart. You have to show how, no, it's, it's not. He got it all wrong. And here's why it's all wrong. And that's called deconstruction. And this is what they want to do, deconstruct. In Arabic, you say, yehdim. Right? We say, nibni. We want to build. We don't want to deconstruct. We want to build. I mean, why would you want to deconstruct something? You see? And we want to deconstruct what they have constructed, which is their deconstruction. Now, if you look at this, this is like an inverted pyramid because the teacher and the subject are on equal level. They never let you know that the teacher doesn't know a lot of stuff as well. Right? It's always as if they're on the same level there. And the student is the recipient, he's, the, uh, he's the, 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 not the, the recipient of all of this great information. This is what Paulo Freire, the South American uh, teacher, called the banking system of education. The child is an empty bank account and we just fill it with all of our wonderful uh, information. Now, really what's happening is that in the Kafir system of education, is that the system is what is being taught and the internal logic will define the student. In other words, the internal logic of the system is what is going to define the student. The student is the one that will be radically altered in order to fit into the model of the system. Now, just to give you a few examples. 
One of the things that the kafir school system uses is bells. Now we know that the Prophet rejected the use of a bell to call people to prayer. And, and, and I would say that education is ibadah. It's a fard on us to learn. And we should reject the concept of calling our children by the bell. Because you will see in a hadith sahih that عند كل جرس شيطان Wherever there's a bell, there's a shaitan. That's a hadith that you'll find in Riyadh al-Salihin. I'm not making that up. Every time you hear a bell, there's a shaitan there. Now, if the Muslims were awake and knew their tradition, when they were walking to school with their children to put it there in kindergarten, and they heard that bring, they would say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Right? But they don't. They take the child in and say, now obey the bell. You see? Now, what obeying that bell teaches the child is that nothing is worth completing nothing the child will be in the middle of doing a project be in the middle of memorizing something being in the middle of working out something being in the middle of doing something creative the bell comes and what the system is saying the system is more important than what you're doing obey the system and leave whatever it is you are doing and that is the message that is being taught to these children and that is criminal because we believe that people should finish what they started and this is part of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al Allah has decreed ihsan, excellence in everything that you do, even in, in sacrifice, killing an animal, or in killing in war, to do it in the best way. So could you move? Now, success is conformity to the model, failure is rebellion to the model. That's how they, you are successful in the Kafir educational system if you conform to the model. You are a failure if you rebel against the model. Now one of the things in, the, uh, Europe, uh, in, in America, they design uh, penitentiaries, the prisons, after the grade school. Uh, and that's because they think that's where they went wrong. The socialization didn't work. Could you move to the next slide, please? Now this, and again, these are models. See, just take what's good and, and leave what's, what you don't uh, agree with. I don't mind. This is just a model, and models are always limited by their nature. But this is a model here, is that in the Islamic model, the first and foremost principle is فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ That over every possessor of knowledge is one who knows more. And that is to create humility in individuals, to create a sense of humbleness, which is rarely what you find in Western academia. You will find quite the opposite, that they inculcate arrogance in their uh, teachers and to question uh, the authorities of these uh, teachers often means losing a grade and I t say this by my own experience in the educational system because I've been in, at the uh, secondary at the uh, uh, college and the university level in this system and often going against the teacher means losing a grade and people learn early on in this system that to regurgitate is the best way to be successful now, in the Islamic model, you have two things happening. You have a downward motion and an upward motion. The teacher and the student are at the same level. And I'm talking here not at the primary. I'm not talking about the mu'addib in the Qur'anic school where the child learns a deep respect for the teacher. And also traditionally in the Muslim uh, education. But I think truly that something went deeply wrong in our educational system when we began to give absolute authority to, uh, to the teachers. This was a danger and it's something that the alim is susceptible to and has to be aware of it in his, in his or her own heart is to become arrogant about what Allah has given them. And the true alim is the one who is humble uh, before Allah and before the, the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this has been consistent with my own experience of, of different scholars that I have been with, that the ones that I have really uh, seen as models of the prophetic teaching are those who were the humblest for their students. And the ones that I saw as really being against that prophetic model were the ones who were arrogant. The Prophet ﷺ was open to suggestion from his students. Even Aisha radiallahu anha, his own wife, when he talked about the hisab, that there will be people uh, that will enter Jannah without a hisab, Aisha radiallahu anha, she, she, anha, she refuted the Prophet ﷺ with the ayah of Quran. She questioned him. She said, Ya Rasulullah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابُهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفِ يُحَاسِبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا And the Prophet sallallahu said, ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْعَرْضِ It's just, that's the ard. That's not a real hisab. And so he explained it to her. But the point is, she was not afraid 
to question something coming from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when she had a higher authority, which is the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Book of Allah is a higher authority than the Sunnah of the Prophet in the Tartib of the Usuliyin. We will always look, our Ummah will always look at the Quran before it looks at the Sunnah. So she, was, she understood that principle and she questioned the Prophet ﷺ and he gave her the best of replies because لا ينطق عما ينطق عن الهوى He doesn't speak from his passions. So what is happening is the knowledge is coming from Allah and the beautiful example of this is the example of Ibn al-Hajj al madkhal when he said that he went to his teacher Ibn Abi Jamra who's one of the greatest scholars uh, of hadith from Al-Andalus and he wrote his famous book Bahjat al-Nufus which is the joy of the selves or the joy of the souls and he, when he went to him he said I want to learn from you O Shaykh and he said we are both students and Allah is the teacher if you want to sit with me and we can learn together from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala marhaba now that is the depth and deep humility and that person inspires love in his students and this is why of the great Imams you will look their students in many instances went completely against their opinion and yet they never said they weren't their teacher Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu was the student of Malik and he said, Ana ghulamun min ghilmami Malik. I'm just a boy from the use of Malik. And that did not stop him from going against the Imam's judgments and opinions in his madhab. In fact, to such a degree that Imam Shafi'i uh, has another madhab, an entirely different madhab. Abu Yusuf and Al Shaybani, uh, radiallahu anhuma, the students of Abu Hanifa. Despite the fact of the brilliance of Abu Hanifa about which Imam Malik said or about whom Imam Malik said if he wanted to prove this pillar was made out of gold he would have done it. Brilliant man, phenomenal intellect, one of the greatest intellects in human history. Despite that fact his two best students disagreed with him in over a third of his opinions. And despite that fact, they did not see themselves as other than students of Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhum jami'an. These are men. Min al mu'minin rijal. These are men. And the same is true of the great women that studied, and there were many of them. Now, if you look here then, what is happening is knowledge or understanding is coming down, and this is called uh, ilham. This is the ilham that Allah gives to His slaves. Not wahi. Wahi is to the prophets. Ilham min ummati muhdathun wa mulhamun. My ummah has people who are given ilham. And this is the type of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives understanding to people, gives fahm to people. Because Allah is the one who gives understanding. And what comes, what the return of that understanding is gratitude. And this is what I'm calling ilm and amal. In other words, knowledge comes down and the gratitude that is returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acting according to that knowledge. And this is the essence of the Islamic educational system is that everything that you learn and understand, you have to recognize it has a zakat and its zakat is action. That is the zakat that you have to give the understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you as you act according to it. And, and the same, now what happens when you give gratitude, when, if you show gratitude, Allah increases you in knowledge, so the knowledge increases. And this is why the Muslims traditionally were always increasing in their knowledge. And at the point when the increasing stops, that means the shukr stopped. There wasn't any shukr. Now one thing you will notice all over the Muslim world is complaints. Muslims are great complainers all over the Muslim world, brilliant at complaining. We make the best complainers. And the, 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 the shukr and the hamd that used to resonate, like one of the poets said, said that this Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came in a living form. People looked at him and thousands of doors swung open. And then that physical form went away and this praising sound filled the world. Muhammad, this praising sound filled the world. And that's what resonated from the Islamic Ummah, was this hamd. And part of the hamd was this deep understanding. 
And what resonated from that deep understanding was saying, Alhamdulillah, because they were witnessing, they were in the shuhud, the mushahada of the minan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the bounties and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is what should be inculcated in the student. This is what should be inculcated in the student, so that we become people of hamd and shukr. And that is, the, that is how the, the, the Islamic educational model really is, 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 is based on. Could you move Bismillah? Now here if you look, this is a, I'm looking at both now. In the Kafir system, which equals oppression, because it's based on oppressing human beings. And the Muslim system is, is, is liberation. Because what the Muslim system does, is it makes you Abdullah wa hurrun li ghayrillah. It makes you a slave to Allah and free from the creation. Free from the creation. You are hur. The Muslim is hur. But he's Abdullah. And that's where his hurriya comes from. That's the secret of our freedom is in our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opposite is true of the kafir system. They rebel against the servitude of Allah and believe themselves to be free. And because of that, become the servants of the lowest qualities of their selves. They become Abdul Hawa, Abdul Dunya, Abdul Dinar, Abdul Dirham, Abdul Qamisa, Abdul Sayyara, Abdul Nidam. This is what they become the slave of all of these things. Ta'asanli Abdul Dinar wa Dirham. How wretched is the slave of money? This is what the Prophet said. And he said, Mudmin al Khamar ka'abid al Wathan, Mudmin al Zina ka'abid al Wathan. The one addicted to intoxicants is like the one addicted to an idol. The one addicted to fornication is like the one addicted to an idol. The worshipper of an idol. And you look, part of the, uh, the, the intoxication of this age is all of this, uh, the, one of the signs of the end of time is the istikhdam adat al lahu, the use of entertainment the means of entertainment, which we've entered into an age of entertainment. This is called the entertainment age. This is what people spend their lives doing, wasting it away. So if you look there, the key concept is, is on the top there is that information, which is indoctrination. In other words, in the Kafir model, they want to give you information, but the information is really an indoctrination into the way they view the world, which is materialistically, which is nihilistically, and it, uh, they believe like Nietzsche articulated in the transvaluation of values, that there are no values, that we've transcended values. Which also value is a word from uh, Nietzsche as well. That's not even a traditional Christian term. The Christians believed in virtues, and the Muslims believed in fada'il. So on the Muslim side, it's wisdom, worship, servitude, vice regency. And this is embodied in the the ubudiya to Allah leads to khilaf of al-ard. That if you have servitude to Allah, then you enter into the khilafah in the earth. And then the basic foundation is in the kafir system, the child's ability to absorb. They know the child has massive ability to absorb and they exploit that and utilize it. In the Muslim, it's the divine right of a child to know the Adamic nature and the parental responsibility to teach that every child has the right to know. Every child has the right to know. Ibn Majah relates the hadith that seeking knowledge is incumbent upon every Muslim and Muslimah. And this means that the parents must give the child the fard of learning this knowledge. Now, the key resource there is intellect and wealth, because if you look, their system is based on massive expenditure of money and utilization of things. Traditional Islamic uh, education was not based on all of this pseudo uh, tools, like computers and things like this, as if computers are going to save the day. I mean, computers are, are really going to probably destroy uh, the educability of the, of the children of this age. They're just going to get stupider and stupider. Uh, the, the, the key resource for the Muslims is fitra, the inherent brilliance of the child, the ability to absorb. And if you look at your own children that you've had, if you haven't wrecked them yet, the, the, the child is, is, is filled with a desire to know. They want to know. And that desire to know should be nurtured and encouraged, not 
stunted and stifled, which is what happens in this culture. The child is asking questions constantly because it wants to know. It wants to know what is the illa, what is the cause, what's the reason for this. That's why children will constantly ask you, why, why, why did that happen? What is this? What's that mean? Who did that? They hear a sound, what was that? They want to know everything. You hear a sound, you don't pay attention to it because your reticular formations just got used to blocking those out. But they hear a sound, they say, what was that? They want to know, what was that? And you would be amazed that they're quite content when you tell them that Allah made that. Allah did that. It makes sense to them. They don't have a, they don't have a problem with that. I, my wife said to my boy the other day, uh, now who is Allah? And he said, the crusader of the heavens and the earth. And she said, no, the creator of the <laughs> heavens and the earth. But he's only four and he'll get it right. Inshallah. The ultimate goal. Now in the Kafir system, it is capitulation for the poor. This is the ultimate goal. They want the poor to basically capitulate to the logic of the system, to enter into an oppressive system, and to not challenge their own oppressed conditions. And this is what happens to the minorities and to the people from the dominant culture who are not people of wealth, which is becoming increasingly the majority of peoples. And so this is the idea to surrender to Big Brother. If you read uh, Orwell's book at the end, the, the protagonist of the book surrenders to Big Brother and says, I love you, I love you, Big Brother. And this is what they want people to do, to surrender completely to Big Brother. And Big Brother is uh, Al-Akh Al-Kabir. It's more a shaitan Al-Akbar, like it was uh, called by one of the uh, recent uh, political leaders. The, the standard... Uh, for the Muslim, it's, uh, the goal is to create a good human being, not a good citizen, a good human being. Because being a good human being sometimes necessitates going against what be, being a good citizen is. You see, sometimes it means challenging the society of which you are a part of. So we don't want good citizens. We want good human beings. Muhsinun, mu'minun, muslimun. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Muslimu man salam al-Muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi. Al-Mu'minu man amin al-Nasu min lisanihi wa yadihi. So this is the nature. We are trying to inculcate a doer. And if you look at all three of the words, Muslim, Mu'man, and Muhsin, those are all fourth-based verbs that are active participles of a root which is the, the base is muf'il, and the muf'il is a causative form. It's something that does things. Muslims are not passive recipients. They are people that go out and do things. The Muslim by his nature is somebody who's actively doing something. He's a fa'il. That's called ism fa'il in Arabic. A fa'il is the one who does something. And the fa'il is marfu'a. The fa'il is raised up. But if you're the object, if you're the passive recipient, if you're what's called ism maf'ul, then you're mansub, you're lowered and raised down, you're abased. And that's the nature. So the Muslim is the one who is doing things, he's changing the world that he's in. And when they ask, مَا سَرَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نَطْعِمْ مِنَ الْمِسْكِينَ وَكُنَّ نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ We didn't use to pray. And that doesn't just mean if you're doing your five routinized prayers a day, you can still fall into that category. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, There's no, nothing from the prayer except what was understood. In other words, you don't gain from your prayer if you're not in a state of muraqaba, if you're not in a state of presence. There are people of khushu'ah. There are people of, in the presence, in the divine presence, which is awareness that Allah, and this is maqam al-ihsan, and ta'budullah ka'annaka tara, fa illam tukun tarahu fa innuhu yaraq. And this is what we want to create, Muslim, mu'min, muhsin. We, that's what we want to do. But you can't have ihsan without mujahada. And read Surah Al-Ankabut. There's no ihsan without mujahada. And so we are inculcating in our children a love of struggle and a desire to struggle and persevere in the path of Allah and laziness has completely dominated our uh, ummah
We are Ummah Kaslana, and the Prophet ﷺ used to seek refuge from Kasal. I bika min al-Adzi wal Kasal. I seek refuge in incapacity and laziness. And incapacity, like the Imam uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya said, incapacity is when you desire to do something but you can't do it. Laziness is when you have the ability to do it but you don't desire to do it. Wa na'udhu billahi min kibt al Both of these are wretched states to be in. al ajizun wal Kusala. Who gets up to their prayer like lazy people? Al-Munafiqoon, the hypocrites. So we want to raise up a, an ummah that's based on Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, which is the three dimensions of Islam. Not just one, not like now we've got all these people walking around thinking they're mu'minun. Uh, you know, I'm a Muslim in my heart, brother, right? And that's what people have told me. I, I was in uh, one of the Muslim countries and, and this, he said, oh, you're a Muslim from America? I said, yeah. He said, alhamdulillah. I said, are you Muslim? Cause I like to ask these people sometimes, make them think a little bit. You know, he's in, what are you, you know, he's in Saudi Arabia. Doesn't he know 100% everybody's Muslim here? No, you say, oh, are you Muslim? Ask. They're asking you, are you Muslim? I say, yeah, are you Muslim? Oh, yeah, I was born Muslim. And that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> haven't you, haven't you? There's a bab in fiqh called Bab al ridda <laughs> that means leaving Islam once you were a Muslim and he said I'm a Muslim here I said that's not where Islam is that's where Iman is <laughs> Islam is outside right not Iman is not uh, outside Islam is outside Iman is inside and that's the balanced human being that's called a munafiq and a munafiq is the one where Islam is outside and there's no Iman inside but there's no we don't have a term that means a, a, a Muslim inside. There's no term in our vocabulary. The standard of excellence of these people is academic achievement. And I put an emphasis on academic achievement because you can look if this person who's now uh, accused of being the Unabomber, this is somebody who graduated with the highest honors from Harvard, the best university that they have. And he's a, uh, a sociopath that can't even uh, socialize with human beings. This is somebody who got honors in their, in their educational system and was a professor at, a, at a, one of the top universities. So that's their criterion of excellence. That's not our criterion of excellence. If somebody's brilliant and they're, they're not, uh, they don't have akhlaq, they're a failure in the Islamic educational system. They're a failure. If no matter how genius they are and brilliant and they can memorize everything and quote everything and bring it all together, if they don't have basic humanity, they're a failure as far as the Islamic model is concerned. The, 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 the standard of excellence for us is ihsan and adab. Adab, which is right behavior. Adab is courtesy, but it's a deep spiritual courtesy. It's not this uh, lip service. It's, it's somebody, mu'adab is somebody who ha has, has a deep and the Prophet ﷺ, even though the hadith has some weakness in it, the ulama agree that it's a sound meaning. My Lord has given me adab and what excellent adab he gave me. His adab was based on ahsana fa ahsana ta'dibi. It means it came from ihsan. So his adab was based on ihsan. And then the key teacher resource is information experience. That's the key teacher resource in the kafir model. In the Muslim model is taqwa, khuluq, azim, knowledge which equals ilm and amal. So the first criterion is that you want a taqi to teach your child. And there's a beautiful story of Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani who was given, when he memorized Fatiha, his father gave him 40 dinars, which is a massive sum of money. When the mu'allam who was teaching him Quran said, Subhanallah, you gave him 40 dinars ala al-Fatiha, يعني ala al-Baqara. What are you going to give him for Baqara? And, and Ibn Abi Zayd's father said, I don't want you to teach my son. If you have uh, valued Al-Fatiha with 40 dinars, then you're not going to teach my son. And look who Ibn Abi Zayd is. But Ibn Abi Zayd is not Ibn Abi Zayd without Abu Ibn Abi Zayd. The father. And there's no great alim in the Muslim world that doesn't have a great mother and a great father behind him. And I guarantee you, unless they were yatim, and then they had a great murabbi. And that's why the Prophet had the best of, of the man yurabbi. He had Rabbil Alameen. He was the yatim. He was the orphan who was trained and educated by the Lord of the worlds. 
And that's why وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Because كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ His khuluq was the book of Allah. That's how Aisha described it. And so the primary overseer are the so-called experts, standardized tests. They'll, they'll tell you how well your child is doing. If they get good grades on the test. Oh, your child's doing excellent. Well, he's totally antisocial. He spends all the day in front of this computer screen. He won't talk to us anymore. Well, that's, that's okay. He's doing great in school. At least he's not out there in a gang or something like that. <laughs> right? I mean, really. Whereas from the primary we is Allah. We teach our children that Allah is muraqib, that Allah is watching them wherever they are, that Allah has the angelic realm taking care of them, that we have two angels on us wherever we go and they're with us. Allah is with you wherever you go in His knowledge. And this is what's inculcated into the child so they don't, they don't, they don't learn to hide their shame is before Allah as well as the creation. Yastahimin al khaliq. They are ashamed before Allah just as they're ashamed before the creation, more so before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happens in the munafiq society is that children are taught to be ashamed in front of other people, but they have no shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in the, so there is the Quran is the standard. So the child learns that the standard by which they are judged is in the Quran. If they want to know how they are, they look at the descriptions in the Quran of those who Allah has praised and of those who He has blamed. And they find out where they fit in the book of Allah because we all fit in there. Any, anyone in this room, if you want to know where you are, just look in the book of Allah. Allah describes the kuffar, the munafiqun, and the muslimun, the mu'minun, the muhsinun, the fasiqun, the zalimun. You can find your name in there. I guarantee you, Allah has a laqab for you. Allah has a, a, a title for you. You'll, you'll find yourself in there. I'll find my, we'll all find ourselves in there. And that title is what you're going to come on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah with. Not Al-Ustad Al-Kabir, not a Shaykh Al-Fulani. You're going to come with that title. And then angels teaching them about the angelic realm, the parents, and then the teacher. And the teacher is similar to the parents. It's really a murabbi thani And interestingly enough, in the system of education by, put out forth by Rudolf Steiner, who was a German Christian, he believed that children should have the same teacher in the primary level for at least four or five years so that they become like a parent to them. And that was the traditional model that the Muslims used. A teacher, a child would stay with a teacher for several years, usually four or five years. And the, the teacher became like a second father to them or a second mother. And they would bring them gifts. And on the Eids, they would bring them uh, gifts and things like this. And they honored them like a parent. And in Mauritania, one of the first things they taught me was مَنْ عَلَّمَكَ حَرْفْ فَهُوَ أَبُوكَ The one that teaches you one letter is your father. In other words, understand that when you learn knowledge, that that person now is your murabbi. He's your mu'addib. Now in the peer influence, in the Western kafir model, there is unchecked. The peer influence is unchecked. And Sheikh Al-Haddad, the mujaddid of the uh, 13th uh, Hijri century, the great Yemeni scholar, said, Afsadu shay'an al awlad, awlad. The most corrupting element on children is other children. And how true is that? Because you put your children into these schools and see how long they last. They just fall into that influence of the worst elements. And then here, uh, in the Muslim, the peer influence is focused on shared responsibility, mutual reminding. It's focused on ta'awun. We teach our children about ta'awun. We teach them to work together. We teach them about the power of synergy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to stay together. That the Prophet said, Al Muslimun tatakafa adima'uhum, wa hum yadun wahidatun ala ma siwahum, wa al Muslimu kathirun bi akhihi. This is what we inculcate in our children, is that we're powerful in our numbers and we're weak when we're broken and divided. And so we teach at the early level. And this is why there's disunity all over the world. Because one of the things that this Kafir educational institution teaches people is to compete in the worst ways with their own fellow peers. And the Muslims don't compete like we compete in academics. We compete 
with our own selves, our own inherent capacities. And this is why traditionally the Muslims didn't grade children on a standard, a mean. There were no grades. The grades is literally a 17th century invention by an a, 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 a Anglo-Saxon uh, Cambridge uh, don. That's the truth. Muslims never graded their children. And don't think that they won't. If you think grades are the only thing, that's the, that, teaching them to do things just out of that, no. They want darajat with Allah. And darajat with Allah are things that nobody knows but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Teaching them, inculcating in them to work together, to help each other. If you read a beautiful book which was written about the Islamic educational system translated into uh, English, um, and I, I, the titles lost me right now, but there was a beautiful section on the preceptorship system of the traditional Islamic madrasas where students would go to other senior students and they would become like students of the student. And that was because one student who was known to understand the, the books really well, they would go and that's the type of relationship. So there was a relationship created of mutual responsibility and that student would see it as an opportunity to help his brother or to help her sister and this is the way uh, the the educational system formulated I'm gonna I've been given uh, uh, my notice here and I'm really not done um, and I don't know if we can I know we need to break for uh, Maghrib and then can we come back uh, can, can we come back for about probably 20 minutes and then I, I'll do some uh, you know, we can talk about this. I, is that acceptable for people? Huh? Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa Sharaf al-Anbiya wa al-Mursalim wa alihi al-Tayyibin wa sahabatim wa mtibi'ahim bi ahsanan ila yawmidin. Alhamdulillah, I... Yeah. Alhamdulillah, this, this subject... This subject is a, an extensive subject and... It, it's really not the subject of even an hour, two hour, three hour presentation. It, it needs a serious deliberation and it really needs some of the better minds of our ummah to come together and really look at what's taking place because to deny that we're in a crisis is really an act of stupidity our ummah is in I think the greatest crisis that it's ever been confronted with much greater than the time of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and the first uh, conquest that took place uh, in Palestine by the Crusaders were now followed with uh, a second uh, occupation of Palestine by the um, Jewish uh, oppressors that exist there. Uh, now they're over there celebrating the election of Netan Yehudi, right? You know Netan in Arabic means foul. And Yahoo, Yahoo, you know, the Arabs have what's called Tarkhim in Arabic where they break, a, like they, instead of saying Ya Sahib, they say Ya Sah. So Yahoo is like Tarkhim of Yahudi. So we're dealing with Netan Yahudi, the, the foulest of the Yahud, Netan al Yahud. Uh, and they put him in power because they want uh, really to squelch anything left of the resistance. Uh, that exist in that place. I mean, it's fascinating that the Hezbollah in... Uh, and I, all these names are horrible for groups to take names like that because Hezbollah, you know, like the Prophet who said to the Bedouin who said, Allahumma arhamni wa arham Muhammadan wa la tarham siwana. Oh Allah, have mercy on me and have mercy on Muhammad and don't have mercy on anybody else. The Prophet ﷺ said, you've constricted the vast. Dayiqt al -wasi so when a group calls himself Hezbollah, you know, the Hezbollah is not, and the U.S. intelligence estimates their active membership at 800 people, right? So the Jewish uh, tyrannizing forces went in there and, and, and destroyed homes and infrastructure all over Lebanon because of 800 uh, people 
which is not the real reason, but uh, the point being is that we are in serious confrontation. Now, part of what existed at the time of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, and we, unfortunately, we tend to be a people who put our leaders uh, so high they become inaccessible. And this is even true of the, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who, there's no doubt he's afdaru khalqillah, He's the best of creation, but he's also uswa. وَلَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا He's the, me the messenger, is the example for this ummah. And what's happened in many sections of the Muslim ummah, the Prophet ﷺ no longer becomes accessible as a, as a model. He's, he's literally placed to a degree of, of exaltation where he's no longer humanly accessible to people. And that, that is, it's tragic. And that is in no way denigrating his maqam. The Prophet ﷺ has the highest maqam of, of the creation. And he is the best of creation. Khayru khalqillah. But he's still uswatun hasana. He's a good example. And he was meant to be followed. He wasn't meant to be uh, deified like Isa salam. And although the Muslims, alhamdulillah, have not fallen into that same trap that the Christians did, nonetheless, there's a way of of, of objectifying the Prophet ﷺ to a degree where we no longer see the humanity of the Prophet. We no longer see the man who sewed his own clothes. We no longer see the man who went in the marketplace and bought his uh, vegetables and bought his food for his household. We no longer see the man وسلم, who prayed amongst his Sahaba. We don't see the man who sat in the circle of his Sahaba and smiled when they told silly stories of their jahili days. We no longer see the man who, when he sees uh, Nughair uh, walking in the street, Abu Umair, and he asks him, what, what did you do with the little bird? We don't see the man. I mean, really, we, we've lost sense of this man who walked amongst human beings as a guide. And that's who these men took him as. They took him as a guide. And they exalted him. He was sent to, to be exalted and dignified and to be respected to a degree. They, we know the Sahaba, some of them used to drink the remains of his wudu. It's in the Shifa of Qadhiyyad. We know Barakah drank the, the, uh, the urine of the Prophet ﷺ without knowing that it was urine. But she drank it and his urine was tahir by consensus of the ulama. And, but she drank it and she said, min batni abada. I never had a stomach ache after that day. And so there's, they had a great respect and love for the Prophet ﷺ. But nonetheless, they took him as an example. They took him as their imam, as their paragon and model. And this needs to be renewed in the, this ummah, that we need to go back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And one of the things I would say about the Islamic education, if we're not training our children to take the sunnah upon themselves and to model themselves after the Prophet ﷺ, then our education is a failure in every aspect. We need literally to renew this ummah, the ahad with this ummah. We need to renew the ahad to the Messenger of Allah and to the Book of Allah. This is what we have to do. ad dinu nasiha And he said, Liman ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet said, Li kitabi la, wa li sunnati rasuli la, wa li ahimmat al-Muslimin wa khasatihim wa ammatihim. Wa ammatihim. Nasiha is sincerity to Allah and to the Messenger of Allah, to the Book of Allah, to the Messenger of Allah, and then to the leaders of the Muslims, the rightly guided leaders who establish the deen, then we uh, struggle. And those also, Sallu wa rakuli birrin wa fajr, even those leaders who are, uh, have strayed from the right path in everything other than disobedience to Allah, then we support them because it strengthens the shauka of the Muslims. So the Muslims even did jihad against bad uh, rulers. I mean this is historical because they understood that the maslaha of the ummah, the benefit of the ummah was greater than any individual benefits. And I just want to, I would like to read very briefly from uh, a man, Ibn Jubair, who was one of the ulama of Granata, who took a rihla and that was one of the sunnah of the ulama, siyahatu ummati al-jihad. My, the tourism, I mean a modern word in Arabic, siyaha, but siyaha used to mean a spiritual pilgrimage. The Prophet ﷺ said, the spiritual pilgrimage of my ummah is jihad, and the modern word siyaha is tourism. And that's the modern spiritual pilgrimage of these barbarians, is to go and lie on the beach somewhere, 
uh, they work all year long and go lie on the beach somewhere. Whereas the siyaha of this ummah is jihad, struggle fi sabirillah. And man kharaja yatub al-ilm fa huwa fi sabirillah hatta an yarja. The one that goes out seeking knowledge is in the path of Allah, mujahid in the path of Allah until he returns home. And Allah says in the Quran about, let not all of you go out. La yanfiru kaffa, all of you don't go out. That a group should stay behind, liyatafaqahu fi deen, that learn the deen. So even the people who go out on jihad, there should always be a section of the ummah that their jihad is to maintain the sharia of Allah. Now if you look in the ummah, we have a crisis of knowledge. We have the, the ulama in this ummah now can be counted on the hands. And that's not an exaggeration. And, and the, the people now who even have, are considered ulama, if, if they're honest with themselves, they know that they're, they're nothing compared to the, the ulama of the past. They're nothing. I mean, one of the great scholars of the United Arab Emirates, uh, Sheikh Bayy bin Salik, who's uh, the head of the uh, Qadha in Al Ain, and he has over 30 years of experience in Qadha. And his, his library is huge library, and I never opened up one of his books except I found his markings on the side. And he told me, he said, you know, in previous times we, we would be considered like secondary students. He said, they consider us ulama now. He said, in the old days, we would be lucky to get into al qarawiyyin or into Zaytuna, or into Al-Azhar. And he wasn't being falsely humbled, he was just telling the truth. And so we have to recognize that we need ulama, we need people to rise up to the maqam of this deen, we need people who understand usul, but we don't need ulama al-jumud, ulama that don't understand the age they're living in. And now in the Muslim world, if you look at who's studying in a lot of the uh, uh, Sharia colleges, there are people that uh, they, they are, have difficult time. And that is not everybody, and I'm not denigrating because there's many honorable people that are attempting to learn Sharia. But many of these people, they come out of uh, backgrounds where uh, they're, they're, the level of understanding is not, the degree of intellect is not there that we need to rise to the level of the problems that are confronting this ummah. And if you look at the Muslim, uh, the, the movements in the Muslim world, most of the movements in the Muslim world are led by engineers. Really, this is a fact. Why? Because most of uh, the, 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 the real powerful intellects of this ummah have gone into the uh, sciences, when in previous times they would have gone into sharia. And so unfortunately, like Sayyidina Omar said, tafaqahu qabla an tasudu. Be people of fiqh before you become leaders. Because if you don't have fiqh, yitakhabbatuna. You know, they'll just uh, uh, err by their nature. And so the deen is based on, on substance. Our usul are profound. And our usul are not simply, the usul and fiqh are not simply limited to Islam. They can be applied to any, a corporation could take the usul of Islam and they could apply it for their own benefit. There are universal principles that transcend really even the religious character of their source. But we need people that understand it, that rise to the level of the deen. And we need to dedicate uh, of our children in the traditional Muslim world, every family wanted at least one or two of their children to enter into uh, Islamic studies. At least. But also we have to learn Arabic language. Just learning the Arabic language. We've put it into the Arabic language in order to give you the ability to use your intellect. Because the Arabic language by its nature enlarges the intellectual capacity of the individual. And I guarantee that. Somebody asked me, why should I learn Arabic? I said, because it will increase your intelligence. It will. If you learn the Arabic language, it's a deep language, it's a profound language. It's the language Allah chose to give uh, His last message in. Now if you look, uh, uh, Ibn Jubair went from Granata, now this is, he gives a, it's a rihla, a journey, but I just want to show what he says about Damascus. Damascus, Dimashq, which was one of the greatest cities of scholarship. There were over 70 colleges, 70 colleges in Damascus alone. In the city alone there were over 70 colleges. In Fes there were about 30. And I'm talking about not Jami'a University, colleges for higher education of students who had gone out of the, uh, the primary level and going into serious study of mutun and, and, and things. He says, in this venerated mosque, after the morning prayers, there daily assembles a great congregation, jama'atun azimah, 
of the reading of one of the seven sections of Quran. So every day in, Bani, in the Masjid of Bani Umayyah, they used to recite one seventh of the Quran, they would finish it every seven days. And he said it was a big jama'ah, jama'atun azimah. A huge group. Allah said, La yastami'u qawman fi baytin min... Uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, La yastami'u qawman fi baytin min biyuti Allahi. Yatruna kitab Allah wa yatadarasunahu. Illa haffathum al ma'alaika wa nazarat alayhim sakina wa haffathum al ma'alaika wa ghashyatum Allah bin rahma. That the sakina comes down, the angels will uh, cover them, embrace them, and they will get this tranquility and mercy from Allah will encompass them. Rahma. وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ The rahmah comes with the reading of Qur'an. But look at the hadith, the Prophet said, يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ Not just reciting it, they study it. The Qur'an is meant to be studied. It is a world view that's meant to be imbibed by the individual Muslim to learn to see things as they truly are. اللَّهُمَّ أَرِينِي الْأَشْيَا كَمَا هِيَا the Prophet used to say, show me things as they truly are. Allahumma arini al-haqqa haqqa, warzuqni tiba'a. Show me truth as it is, truth. And give me the ability to follow it. Wa arini al-batira batira, warzuqni ishtinaba. And show me falsehood as it truly is falsehood. And give me the ability to avoid it. And so he said they would do this. And then he said, this is unfailing. In other words, this was something he saw continuous action. And it is the same after the evening prayers for the reading of what is called the Kawthariya. This is in 1151 of the Christian era. This is during the time of the Izzah of Islam. Or Izzah of the Muslimin. Allah is always Aziz. And, and, and His Deen is always Aziz. Islam always has Izzah. al izzatu lillahi. But the Muslims, their izzah is dependent upon whether they practice the deen. لا تهنوا ولا تحسنوا وأنتم رعلون إن كنتم مؤمنين Don't be weak and don't grieve because you're the superior ones. إن كنتم مؤمنين If you're people of iman. إن يمسسكم إن 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 يمسسكم قرح فقد مس القوم قرح مثله if you, if you get afflicted by something, know that they get afflicted by those things too. In other words, what afflicts us, afflicts them as well. We change this matter. Some tribulation is for you and then for them. But look at the Prophet when they said uh, about the qatla of Yom Uhud. And he told Omar to shout back to them, No! Because they said, This is for Badr. Your qatla al yawm is for our qatla on Badr. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? No, tell them, qatlana fil jannah wa qatlakum fil nar. Our dead are in jannah and your dead are in the hellfire. So we're not the same. We're not the same. Our mawla is Allah. And as for those who disbelieve, la mawla lahum. They have no mawla. So he said, and when they read from Surah Al-Kawthar until the end of the book, to this assembly of Kawthar come all who do not well know the Qur'an by heart. And all such participants receive a daily allowance. They were given a stipend in the masjid to maintain this practice. More than 500 persons being able to live from it. So people were paid to recite the Qur'an continuously. This is one of the virtues of this venerated masjid in which from morn till eve the Qur'an is read unceasingly. In it lectures are delivered to students and teachers receive a liberal stipend. The teachers, the ulama used to give a liberal stipend, that means they were given good amount of money. And the ulama used to be honored. And people say, well, ya akhi, they won't do it for uh, the face of Allah, for Allah's uh, wajh, if you give them money or something. No, Islam is to be encouraged. And that's why traditionally one of them said, تَعْلَمْتُ الْعِلْمَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَأَبَى الْعِلْمُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ لِلَّهِ When I began seeking knowledge, I did it for other than Allah because the ulama used to have a big jah with the people. And he, when he began his journey, he began studying for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he said, true knowledge refuses to be for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, he was purified in the process. And this is what happened, and you can look at it now, if you look at many doctors or engineers in the Muslim Ummah now, 
If you have 100 doctors, maybe only 15 of them or 20 are really true doctors. In other words, they have a vocation to heal people. The other people are just doctors because their parents want them to be doctors because it has a status. But still, they benefit people. You can still go to that one. You might not get the same bedside manner. You might not feel as comfortable with him, but he can still benefit the person because he's learned a knowledge. Well, traditionally, it was the same with the ulama that they were all sought knowledge, maybe out of a hundred ulama, there were only 15 or 20 that were real people of taqwa and, and, and these type of things. But despite that, even the ones that weren't benefited other people, and the Prophet ﷺ talks about the ulama who benefit people, yufidun al-nas, wala yantafi'una bi'ilmihim, they don't benefit from their knowledge, but other people benefit from them. And the hadith is famous about the alim on yawm al-qiyamah, people see him going into the fire and they said, it was because of you we were saved. Well, how can you be going to the fire? And the alim says, because I didn't benefit from my knowledge. But the deen is preserved by ulama, by men and women who take it upon themselves to learn the deen. And this doesn't mean, you know, people say, what about the dunya worldly sciences? We're backward now. We need, we, we need to catch up in technology. We need to have more engineers, more technicians, these type of things. Subhanallah. This, intel, this type of understanding has destroyed this ummah. Because first of all, we did not lose the Islamic sovereignty because of inferior technology. And if you think that, you haven't read the book of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because no group is ever destroyed because of inferior technology. It's quite the opposite. That, that many times Allah causes a small group who's weaker to have victory over a group that's bigger and stronger. Why? Because Allah desires to show His Sunnah. Badr al-Kubra. We celebrate that day every year. Why? Because it's the day of the truth. Despite they had inferior technology, they didn't have the weapons, they didn't have these things. Despite that fact, they had victory. Why? Because like Ibn al-Arabi in his Ahkam al-Quran says, Ibn al-Arabi who was a mujahid in his own time, the great civilian qadi, he said that true strength is in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this ummah is given victory because of its weak people. <laughs> we are given victory because of weakness. In kuntum mu'mineen. لَقَدْ نَصُرْكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ Allah gave you victory on Badr and you were weak and humiliated in the earth. So we have to understand, our way of viewing things is different. But if we don't have people in the masajid learning the book of Allah, if we don't have people of ibadah, if we don't have people calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't have uh, this training going on, then what good are we? What benefit are we? I mean, this is not, I'm not making things up. Study the history of this ummah. So he says here, the strangest thing, then he says that uh, the Malikiyah have a zawiyah for study in the west side because he was from Morocco, uh, from Andalusia, and he just mentioned that, and there the students from Al-Maghrib who receive a fixed allowance assemble. The conveniences of this venerated masjid for strangers and students are indeed many and wide. They honored the ghuraba. People coming from now, uh, if you're from another country, it's like you're from another planet. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً إِنَّ هَذِي أُمَّةً أُمَّةً إِنَّ هَذِي أُمَّةً أُمَّةً وَإِنَّ هَذِي أُمَّةً أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاتَّقُونَ This is, your ummah is one ummah. So have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah made us brothers and sisters. He made us brothers and sisters by the kalima. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and all this division farriq tasud and this is part of what the educational system does inculcates in people a sense of their Egyptianness of their Syrianness of their Pakistaniness of the no we inculcate in our youth a sense of their Islam that Islam is paramount and that we're one ummah we're a body and it doesn't say we all have to become like each other. No, it honors cultures. Islam honors people's traditions. It honors their cultures. The Sudanese have a beautiful culture. You go and you see things that you don't see in other places. If you go to Egypt, then uh, you eat Amruddin for the iftar. They don't have that in Sudan, but Sudanese like it when they go to Egypt for iftar. 
Maybe they have it. Do they have Amr al-Din in Sudan? They got it from Egypt. You see, so, so good things come from culture. You see, you go and, you know, they like it and they bring it back. Islam just gets rid of the dirt. It's like if you have a big feast and you go in and in the middle there's a pig and all around it are good things, fruits and all these things. All Islam does is it takes the pig out and says this is harmful, throws it away. But everything else is kulu wa sharabu. And that's what Islam does with culture. It comes into a place and it looks, there's good things in Canadian culture. Not everything is bad. Most things, but not everything. <laughs> So there are things that Islam, if it came here, it would preserve them, it would honor them. And it would say, no, there's nothing wrong with that. But it would also clarify, because it's Furqan. يُفَرَّقْ بَيْنَ الْحَقِّ وَالْبَاطِلِ So what the good things that it would do, it would keep, like punctuality. That, 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 unfortunately, we have to learn from them. And Islam, the Prophet subhanAllah, he waited three days for a man before Islam, in one place. He waited three days. That was how strong his wa'ad was. And when the man finally showed up, he forgot all about his appointment. The Prophet, all he said was, "Atabtani," you know, you wore, you wore me out waiting for you. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I mean, the prayer itself teaches us punctuality. Not obsessive like clocks. People saying, "When's he going to finish here?" <laughs> we don't, we don't have to be that punctual. So, then he says, "This is so amazing. The strangest thing to tell of this mosque." concerns the column which stands between the old and the new maqsura. It has a fixed waqf for the benefit of those who lean against it in meditation and study. <laughs> there were pillars that somebody donated from his wealth money to support anyone that wanted to lean against that pillar and meditate. Tafakkur. I mean, what kind of people were that? It's something amazing. In fast, they have a waqf there to this day that feeds stray cats. Somebody left a waqf that somebody goes out and feeds the cats. The, these Muslims were extraordinary human beings. We saw beside it a faqih from Seville called Al Muradi in the morning at the end of the assembly for the reading of a seventh section of the Quran each man leans against a column while in front of him sits a boy who instructs him in the Quran the boys also have a fixed allowance for their reciting but those of their fathers who are fluent prohibit their sons from accepting it they're teaching them iffa although the remainder do so then he says this is one of the virtues of Islam هَذِهِ فَضِيلَ مِنْ فَضَائِلَ الْإِسْلَامِ The waqf system, where people donate money for people to study, to give them iffa. And traditionally, one of the, in the books of fiqh, in, in the book Ibn Hamdun, on his hashia of, uh, of uh, al-mayyara, says that it is not a fault or a blemish for the talib ilm to ask from wealthy people to support him. The wealthy people should be looking for tulab, to support, to help them in their studies. And if you look in this kafir system, they give endowments. They have endowments. They help people, what? For kufa, to increase their power. They have think tanks. They have Rand Corporation, Ford Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. They give huge uh, amounts of money for people to spend two years doing nothing but studying so that they can write a book that ends up in the, in the Pentagon or in the State Department. They let them go and study in Syria for two years so they can understand the social system and how it works. They do this for kufr. And we're supposed to be ashaddu hubban lillah. We should have more love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than these people for their taghut. And yet we don't see it. With rare exception. And then he says here, well, then he says, uh, for orphan boys, there is in the town a large school with a generous endowment, waqfun from which the teachers draw enough to sustain themselves and disimbursements are made from it to support and clothe the children this is also one of the uncommon things to tell of the virtues of these lands the instructions of boys in the Quran in all these eastern lands consist only of making them commit to memory writing they learn through the medium of poetry and other things the book of, the, of Allah Ta'ala is thus kept undefiled from the markings and rubbings out of the boy's efforts. 
I mean, he's saying in Andalusia they didn't have this habit, but he was praising a quality that they would give the Quran by talqeen, shathawi, in order that the boys wouldn't write the Quran and then erase it. They didn't want to defile the book with erasure. It's so beautiful. And this is ta'zim. وَمَنْ يُعَظْلُمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَ الْقُلُوبِ those who exalt the, these, uh, these standards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is from the taqwa in the hearts of the people. And they had great taqwa and ta'zeem for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this goes on, it's, it's a very beautiful, uh, it will make you weep when you read it. You'll weep, you know, because it's lost. These traditions are gone, you know. So I think just uh, in, in, in summary, we, as, as people, and here in Toronto, we, there's something that we can do. And there's, there's one thing we need to understand which is important and it keeps the Muslims, and this is something that is borrowed from a corporate model, but I think it's very valid. There's an idea of what's called a circle of concern and a circle of influence. The circle of concern is the greater circle. Like our concern is for the whole ummah. مَنْ لَا يَهْتَمْ بِأَمْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَلَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ أَوْ أَمْرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ The one not concerned about the Muslims isn't from amongst them. So we concern ourselves with the Muslim. But where is our circle of influence? Where can we really have ta'thir? Now we can have ta'thir by making dua for the ummah. So the, the ta'thir extends beyond even what we have physical or monetary power to change. So we make dua for this ummah and the dua has an effect. But what about that physical uh, effectiveness that we can have? We have to limit ourselves to our circles of influence, to recognize that each one of us has a limited da'ira, da'ira to ta'thir, this circle of influence. And we have to benefit by recognizing where it extends to and then work within that circle. And part of one of the, uh, I think, mechanisms of kufr now in this day and age is to exhaust all of the Muslim resources by scattering all of their uh, work all over to where there's no emphasis on the local, at the local level. And the primary concern of a community is always at the local level. Always. Zakat in most of the books of fiqh is to be given back to the same community that it was taken from. It's taken from the rich and it's given to the poor before it goes into a central uh, collection. It only goes into the central collection when there's no one to collect zakat at the local level. So there should be a local concern because if you increase your local infrastructure, then that, your sphere of influence, increases. When people see the Muslims successful here, then Toronto becomes a model. And I've heard Toronto used as a model in other places, as a way of encouraging people to do things. That's not, I'm not making that up. I've heard things that are happening here being used as examples in other places. So if we strengthen our local communities, we need to create neighborhoods where Muslims can be, our children can be raised as much as possible in that first model within a society fixture where they have a sense of Islam around them. So if we create Muslim neighborhoods where Muslims live in the houses together, buying houses in the same areas, and we literally create Muslim neighborhoods so that people pray Fajr together, they pray Isha together, they uh, have the, the women and the children are in an environment that's conducive to their Islam. And the women have a huge responsibility. They have a huge responsibility. Because you can't be frivolous people. You can't let shaitan just uh, uh, take your intellect, steal them away from you. No, your, your uh, beings endowed with intelligence and integrity just as much as the men are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not preferred uh, in these things the men over the women. No. There were great women of scholarship in this ummah. And if you study the, some of the greatest universities, there's a whole college in Al-Azhar that was donated by a Muslim woman that still functions to this day. Fatima al-Fihriya, the great uh, uh, Muslim waliya from Fas who donated the entire university of the Qarawiyyin, which has produced again and again ulama uh, all over that spread the message of Islam all over Africa, especially North Africa and Andalusia. We know the foundation of the Sankuri University, Jamiat Sankura in Timbuktu, was donated by a woman. Women had great concerns for education because it was their children that they were going to be putting into those institutions. And we have never had a great, and I said this before and I say it again, we have never had a great 
Muslim or Muslima that didn't have a great mother behind them unless they were yatim. And then they had a great murabbi or murabbiya. And you read Ahmed Zarruq, his grandmother who raised him because he was an orphan. She used to hide food in his house when he grew up as a little boy. And, she, and he would say, I'm hungry. And she said, let's make dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if there's some, that he'll give us some food. And they would make dua. And then she said, let's look. Maybe Allah put some in the house. And they would go look together. And then he said they would find it. And he would pray praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would eat the food and he said I realized when I grew old and I had my intellect she was inculcating in me tawakkul she was teaching me how to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are the kind of women that we need that are going to uh, to raise another generation at Umm al-Madrasa in adata adata sha'ban tayyiba tayyib al-Araqi the mother is the madrasa, she is the school. If you prepare her, you've prepared a deep people, a people of roots, a people of substance. And if she's ignored and belittled, then you've ignored and belittled your own ummah. So this is something we have to be aware of. The women have a great responsibility and a great challenge in this age. And we need to understand what our a tradition is. And I'm not saying that we have to go back to... Uh, to um, you know, the, the, some kind of madrasa model where there's nothing. No, there are, benefit, there are beneficial things that have happened and occurred in this time. But things need to be put into perspective. And we need to realize what are our goals. The goal uh, of education has never been economic fulfillment in Islam. Because a rizq is the amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا the one who has taqwa of Allah, Allah will give him a way out. And he will provide from him from where he is, has no... It means where he didn't even expect it to come from. So there are people that study for years to be a doctor. And I know a man in, uh, in California, he's from an Arab background. He studied for years to be a doctor. He hates medicine. And he told me he just did it because his father wanted him to do it. Now he's a businessman, he's very successful. And he's a very devout Muslim. So the point is, you don't know where Allah is going to provide you. And the truth is, this is an age in which uh, nobody has any aman. There's no istiqrar anymore. And there never was in reality. It's an illusion. Because like the Prophet said, Al-Mawtu aqrabu ilaykum min shiraki na'alikum. Death is closer to you than the, the, the strap on your sandal. So no one has any, there's no aman. A'amintum man fi samai an yakhsifu bikum al-ard. Do you have any security in the earth that he won't just shake it up? So we have no uh, security. Our security is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the mu'min is the one that you aminu nafsahu ma'allah. He's the one that his security, he places it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is also a mu'min. That's a name of Allah. And if your mu'min be la, Allah you aminuka. You aminuka min al balaya wa razaya wa sharr. So these, all of these things, we have to be really uh, start waking up. We're in a deep sleep and we're in a crisis situation and our crisis is one of knowledge. It always has been, it always will be. And I'm not talking about information, I'm talking about deep knowledge that is transformative by its nature, that changes people, that makes them better people, makes them people of ilm and amal. And this is where we have to go. We have to create institutions where Muslims can learn again. We need to bring life to our masajid with the Qur'an, with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is all uh, w within the possibility of the human being because we're an extraordinary creature and Allah has endowed us with extraordinary gifts and, and if we turn to Him, then Allah gives us a makhraj, a way out. And um, really I don't uh, have uh, more to say. I'm, inshallah, uh, tomorrow I'm going to uh, talk just about planting seeds. In other words, uh, looking for, you know, what more practical things that we can do. I mean, a lot of this, I'm just trying to just give us, you know, an alternative perspective that's based on my own research into classical Islamic education. And also, that I had the benefit of spending a short time in a traditional madrasa, so I actually could see, because in, in, in the Saharan Desert, there's still madrasas that are functioning the way madrasas functioned a thousand years ago, quite literally that have had no outside influence. And although there are shortcomings to their system, what I noticed is they produce human beings. And this is the great Umar ibn al-Khattab, they were sitting around the Sahaba and they were making wishes. And one of them said, I wished I had uh, a, a, a mountain full of gold that I could spend fi sabirillah. And another one said, I wish that I had all of these uh, uh, 
uh, camels and things that I could give to the Jews so they can ride fi sabirillah. And they asked Umar, what do you wish for? He said, I wish I had a room filled with men like Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Abu Ubaidah and Bilal ibn Rabah. That's what Umar wished for, a group of men. Because with men you can change the world. You don't change the world with, with dunya. You change the world with rijal. And the Prophet ﷺ built human beings. He didn't build... In fact, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani says, لَمْ يَضْعَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ حَجَرًا عَلَى حَجَرٍ He never put a stone upon a stone in his entire life. He planted the, 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 the Kaaba with that hajar. But he did not build buildings. Medina, there's no place to go and see the great buildings that the Prophet ﷺ left behind. He left behind men and women that transformed the world. That's what he did. And that's what he was concerned with. And that's what the Sahaba were concerned with. And so we should be concerned with transforming our youth into Rijal and Nisa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is possible to do that. I don't think it's far-fetched. So... Uh, I've just, I have a question here that please talk about Ibn Khaldun's place in Islamic education. Ibn Khaldun, uh, rahimahullah, was a brilliant uh, scholar. He was a Maliki Qadi. Uh, he was a Mufti, uh, as well as being a historian. He uh, memorized the Mudawwan al-Kubra, which is a f huge book in Maliki fiqh. Uh, he had brilliant intellect. Um, his ideas were literally... Uh, centuries ahead of, of, uh, of uh, his age, including the Muslims. The Muslims weren't ready to hear what he had to say because he was talking about the decline, because he was witnessing the decline of the Muslim Ummah and he was exp explaining its reasons and it was bitter for people. So his books were ignored for, for a long time and it's interesting enough that it's the Europeans that picked up his books. I mean Europeans actually kind of discovered Ibn Khaldun in a lot of ways. Um, the Muqaddimah is an extraordinary book. He does have a section in there which I've read about education. And he basically just is, it's a descriptive, the importance of education. And he talks about the differences between uh, different locations. Like, for instance, in Al-Andalus, he says they were more concerned with beautiful penmanship and the memorization of poetry than they were with the memorization of Quran. And he explains the reason for that is because they wanted to create very eloquent people and they realized that the Quran is inimitable. It cannot be imitated. So, so they felt if the the young boys would memorize Imr al-Qais and Mutanabbi and, and uh, all of these uh, uh, Jahili poets that they would have abilities to uh, speak in eloquent uh, uh, Arabic. And uh, it's, it's, worth, it's been tr uh, translated by Rosenthal. It's called the uh, Prologime, I think, of Ibn Khaldun. And there's a section in there. It's very useful to read. And there's also been a book written on Ibn Khaldun's theory of education, which I've actually read and I benefited a lot from some of his ideas. Um, any suggestion when a husband uh, wa wants the TV in home so he can watch three to four hours of sports, his only recreation? That's not recreation. He's watching recreation. But that's not recreation. You see, recreation is when you go out and, and do something that recreates. I mean, that's what recreation means, to recreate. Um, somebody who can spend uh, four hours watching sports in front of the television ought to be ashamed of himself. And that's all I can say about that. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. Because time doesn't, time doesn't come back. Time is rasmad. I mean, it's your capital and it's, it's, you know, there's like an hourglass and you only have so many grains of sand in it and it's dripping away, you know. And, and this is something, if you read, there's a beautiful book for those who can read Arabic, Qimatul Zaman and al Ulama by Abd al Fattah Abu Ghudda, uh, Allah, the Syrian scholar from, from, uh, from uh, Aleppo. I think he's Aleppo, Aleppian. Yeah. He, it's a beautiful book that he wrote, and uh, you know, he said, That's how he began it with that line of poetry. That time is the most precious thing that you concerned yourselves with and it's the easiest thing that you can lose. And we have so much time, so we should utilize our time. And then I'm not saying that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, I mean in Mauritania they have a saying, Sa'atun lillahi wa sa'atun lillahi. Right? Uh, like give a time, a time for Allah and a time for some entertainment or something like that. 
Allah is one of the names of shaitan as well, if you look it up in the dictionary there. So you have to be careful with that. But the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, when somebody was going to a wedding, he asked Aisha, did the Ansar have lahu? And they said, uh, they said, was there lahu? And he said, لِأَنَّ الْأَنصَارِ يُعْجِبُهُمَ الْلَهُ They like entertainment. And we know the Prophet ﷺ, he used to like to have some entertainment because he liked to show the Jews and the Christians that he had fusha in his deen. That the deen is not all rigidity and not all. But our lahu should be beneficial. It shouldn't be wasted time. Because even in lahu, there's benefit. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that a man practicing his arrows is lahu, but it's good. And archery is a beautiful sport. It teaches you a lot of things. And the most primary thing that it teaches you, which is why we should teach our children it, that if you miss the, 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 the mark, the marma, what they call the marma, the bullseye, don't blame it on the bullseye. It's the faults in the rami, you see. So if we're missing our mark in, our, in the dunya, don't blame it on the dunya. Blame it on the one who's shooting, you see. And that's what uh, archery teaches you, that it's you who determine where the arrow lands. And then you teach your children sibaha wa rukub al-khayl. Rukub al-khayl is an important thing because khayl in the Arabic language is from khuyala, which is pride. Khuyala is pride and the horse is a proud animal, al-khayl. They say that, you know, the baghla, is, is the, uh, made from a, a, a male donkey and a female horse. And they say if the female horse looks behind her and sees the, the donkey mounting her, she'd die instantaneously out of shame. And that's why they don't look uh, when they're mounted. They think it's a horse there. So the, the khayl is a proud animal. And if you teach rukub al-khayl, you, you teach the child siyasa how to control the nafs because the nafs is proud and arrogant and so you learn how to control the nafs through siyasa, through tadbir and through rukub tarkab nafsik wa la tarkabuka you ride your nafs but don't let your nafs ride you and then sibaha we subhanallah the, the sabaha is from the same root sibaha is swimming and those people who are in a state of mushahada their subhan is because they're witnessing the minin of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're witnessing the qayyumi of Allah. Swimming is a beautiful metaphor for being immersed in, in this unifying element. Because water is a unified element, unlike the, this, the, the, the dry land. Dryness is separation. Water is gatheredness. So teaching children how to swim is teaching them how to immerse themselves in gatheredness as, as opposed to being constantly in separation. And that's why the, in the hajj, uh, Sayyid al-Bahr is permissible, but Sayyid al-Barr is not permissible. And there's wonderful meanings in that. So throw out the TVs. That's my advice. You know, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. About TVs. Because TVs are... Uh, we have to stop because it's the... They're going to kick us out of the hall. Oh, they're going to kick us out of the hall. So, alhamdulillah. hate to be the bad guy. Alhamdulillah. See, I told you the Canadians have some good qualities. Could you, just before it, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum warahmatullahi Before Imam Hamza goes, I'll ask him to conclude it with a dua, inshallah. Um, there's just, uh, there, there's just uh, a few announcements, inshallah, that I'll, that I'll ask one brother to come up and give, and then I'll, uh, we'll, I'll just talk about tomorrow. So, Hussein, if you would just come up and make a few announcements uh, from the table, uh, from the podium, that's fine, and then we'll conclude, inshallah. And once again, Jazakumullah khair for coming. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this event, to bless Imam Hamza's words. And we ask that the examples and the message he gave to us tonight enter our hearts and manifest themselves in our deeds, inshaAllah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. A'udhu billahi s-sami al-alimi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal asl, inna al-insana lafi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته